My name is Rican Vargas, and I am the Commander-in-Chief of the Coney Island Dancers, and this is my movie. My name is Robert Vargas. And your nickname is? Rican Vargas. 
And what do people refer to you in <laughs> Coney Island? Ah, they call me the commander in chief of the Coney Island dancers. In the 80s, you'd have more cultural music. People that were here would play their, you know, instruments. But as far as the DJs go, that started in the 90s, when I could remember. And it just started, you know, it grew from there. And Regan just happened to be part of that move in the 90s. And he, and he hung around and he watched. And that's when he got the idea to do the Coney Island dances and bring it, get the equipment and really make it happen. Definitely the move here was a decision on my dream, what I wanted to accomplish it. That's the truth. That is actually the truth. I remember living on, I was, we sweet blues with Cena. We moved over to Lafayette and Tompkins for a, a stint, you know, a few months. And this is still the old Coney Island. I mean, I, I said, I want to, I, I told Cena, Cena was like, yeah, right. I said, no, I want to make Coney Island dances bigger. You know, I want to, because I knew guys like Dick Ziggins was doing the Mermaid Parade, actually, and I even haven't gone to a Mermaid Parade. Uh, it was not really something that I wanted to do. It was something that, you know, we needed to be paying less rent, and we needed a place to live, and it was hard Mommy. to find a place uh, Mommy. with, um, and I was depressed because I we had just Mommy. lost the baby. And, you know, I was, I just kind of let myself, again, go with the flow. I wanted to live in Coney Island because I wanted to get to the next level. The next level was to come over here. My dream was to do events first and talk about autism awareness. That's it. That's what I wanted to do. See? What was, how soon after was your first uh, event? Your first camp? What, year, what, what year was it? I think it was nine, 2009. It was the summer of 2009 that I first caught wind. First time I saw Regan, I guess I, I had heard the music. Uh, I was in my office and I heard the bass and felt the walls rumble. And I said, where is that coming from? And I looked and I said, I think it's coming from West 10th Street. And I said, let me go over there and see what's going on. And there was this great dance party going on. Before that. This is cool music. I like this music. This is fun. I can get into dancing here for a couple of hours. But uh, that was the first time I saw Regan. Looked into it, and I see that there's this group that calls themselves the Coney Island Dancers. Um, and they had this great little party going. I mean, you can't beat dancing on the beach. Like, you have the beach right there. You have rides over here. You have the park. I mean, it's just so much. The, the environment, the ambiance, the people, the demographic is just great out here. It's different. I mean, you. I like the beach. I like being able to dance and see the water, dance and see the sky, you know, just the whole vibe. It's beautiful to dance in the open air, and it's really nice to, to be near the ocean while dancing, especially in a really super hot summer. If you, if you overheat while dancing, you can just jump in the ocean. Frankly, I'm so over the scene that it's not, like, special to me anymore. I don't look forward to doing it, and I'll bring Fabio out for a little bit. You know, you'll catch me here and there to have Fabio visit and to grab the money before it gets lost and misappropriated. Actually, you really hear him before you see him, and what I heard first was the beat. I mean, it was a beautiful dance party on the boardwalk, and that beat was mesmerizing, and the people it attracted were so diverse. You never see such a diverse group. I mean, literally from 8 to 80. Yeah, 2009, I only wore that uniform like one or two times, and that was it. That's the first, but that was the first year you were That was my first year. And we started with this guy speakers, this guy this. Then that was, it was too much headache, man, because... Did Dina have anything to do with the commander outfit? Pull the buttons. What did she think? Hmm? That your interview. <laughs> I will. What do you think? Ah, uh, Jim, early in the morning, all this amazing. He didn't. He just did it. It just, all of a sudden, there it was. Like, he started collecting the pieces. He was like, I'm going to get this. Uh, to me, it seemed like he just kind of appeared as the command. You know, all of a sudden, he was this character. The next year, when we opened Luna Park, um, I, I reached out proactively to the group and said, you know, we're doing an opening, Memorial Day weekend. We'd love to have some local Coney Island uh, talent and flavor there. And uh, ended up talking to Rekin and uh, invited him to the opening. And the next thing I know, he's taking pictures with the mayor. Opening day for Luna Park was the first time that I saw him in the Commander-in-Chief outfit. So 
I was very quickly able to correlate the commander in chief title. First time I saw him in the commander's outfit was actually our opening day. It kind of blew me away to see him in a sailor's outfit and everything like that. It looked, it looked amazing, actually. The commander in his white suit and his uh, dress white of an admiral, it creates an impression. And the fact that he would show up and talk to NYPD or he'd be um, in an official meeting at the Parks Department with the Navy itself for Fleet Week. And he would dare, like, you know, uh, not only wear the uniform, but not hang out in the background, just uh, his upfront personality. I, I respect the, the military and everything. It's just that, you know, I thought the character fit in well, and I have no regrets. Um, the Commander-in-Chief wears his whites and he wears them very well. Not too many guys can wear that outfit and, you know, excuse me, being a little too cocky, but I wear that uniform very well. First I thought, well, the Navy's in town. Now here's this, I mean, when did they get so cool that they would come and dance on the boardwalk? I see this guy in a white uniform and uh, thought, well, he's also got rank. He's the, uh, the commander over there. But uh, then I found out it was Regan, got to know him. And this party is just, this party he holds every week is one of the most beautiful things in Coney Island. It's unplanned. It just takes on a life of its own and everybody enjoys it. And it really is hypnotic. It's a beautiful thing on the boardwalk. What was Regan like like a kid? We were wild, we were crazy. We used to come out broke and come back and rich. <laughs> we were crazy kids, you know, we were in a gang. And, you know, to get our rocks off, we stay out late at night. So every every business that we knew, we just happened to go into the back door. Back door was open for us all the time. Okay, my mother's name is Elba Vargas, and my father was Raymond Vargas, and he's deceased. And I'm proud of my parents. And there's seven of us, and I am the firstborn. Growing up in Tompkins' houses was a... Uh, um, a challenge for uh, for me because I was the firstborn. My mother didn't speak any English. That's why I wind up calling that part of my childhood Vietnam because um, it's very difficult for me. All black neighborhood, actually, um, all black school at the 70s. I must have got here like in um, 67, 66, somewhere around there. Yeah, around there. My mother moved into it around the corner. We might have lived over there for one year, and then we moved over here to 99. And I'm glad we did. This is probably what it was. This building was tight. It was a different era. We grew up together. Um, I've known him since he was little. His family knows my family, so I know Reekin for who Reekin really is. And he's come through a lot. And he's been through a lot of obstacles and struggles to get where he's at today. So, you know, it was a hard fought fight. But we're here. What was he like as a little kid? Oh, a little mess. He was bad, we were all bad. But he was one of the little bad kids, but he was a sweetheart, always had a good heart. I don't know what I know. You know, I know what he tells me, I know what his mother has told me, I know what some of his childhood friends have told me, but uh, you know, who knows what's accurate, what's true. He had a rough time growing up. He was uh, a minority in a majority black ghetto. And uh, he like fought a lot to defend himself and as part of his identity, you know, because his father was a fighter, his grandfather was a fighter. Um, and, uh, you know, in the 70s, being Puerto Rican in a black ghetto was a position that would could put you into danger a lot. Wow, you go my room. Wonder who's up there now. Who am I gonna call? Oh, listen, I just live here. Let me in this one. I was involved in gangs out here. My um, Park Avenue and Tompkins. Anything that came up this way was was all mine. Dead meat. Look at this. You should film this. This is unheard of. Here, Myrtle and Marcy. No, it's not. This what? In the 70s? 70s, yeah. 
Look at that. Motherfucking Cinderella in the hood. My first memory of Coney Island was seeing that big Wonder Wheel. That was it. We was, I was, I was jubilant. You know, I remember under the boardwalk, I remember my mother making the ham and cheese sandwiches with the big old <laughs> public assistant bread. And that's what we ate, sandwiches with sand in it. And a little Kool-Aid. The music, you know, the, 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 the smell of the popcorn and the cotton candy, mm -hmm. you know, and the people, the mobs. I remember that. So how you hit that, Tony? From the back or from the front? came here to help me. Uh, no, but it was Hello, strange. gentlemen, ladies, what was in there? How you doing? Come on. We need to get inside here. Yeah, well, that's where we loaded our stuff. Like we to need to get music. up, man. I gotta get up. I gotta go in here. I gotta go. I'm running late, guys. Come on, Ryan, he's on the child, on the child. I'm load up the equipment. I'm not trying to be disrespectful now, but we have something going on here today. Come on, please. I know this. How you doing? Good morning. Excuse me. Good morning. Hello. Hello, good morning. Uh, no disrespect, but you got to get up out of here. What number are we looking for? What number are we looking for? I got the top one. That's the good one, Tom. Right. Got I got it. No, he went too high. I'm on the top one. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Last night. Hey, what do you want? Right here. Sit up. Come back. So what am I? French fries? Nah, you onion rings, motherfucker. I fucking. All right, look, so are. now I go through the same. Where's the speaker? That went out. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, fuck you. Give me man. a small one. A small one. Where's the small one that we put? A small one going up to the top. You give them everything, you do everything for them, and it's still not enough, bro. Kiss my ass in Macy's window, bro. Oh, he's laughing now. He don't want... Did you sleep with Coco? Did you sleep with Coco? And they write the car, I'm jealous. He slept with Coco. He slept with Coco. Slept, yeah. 17 years old. Forget about school. It wasn't for me. You know, it wasn't cool to go to school. I went to Erasmus Hall. But remember, I just went to the halls. I didn't go to school, you know. I was still a virgin at that age. you imagine that? I didn't know how to approach the opposite sex. I got to tell you this story. My friend, his name was Black David. He used to tell me, I used to tell Dave, man, he was the older guy. I mean, I like this girl over there. He said, well, then go ask her for some pussy. I said, well, he said, just ask her for some pussy. And if she tells you no, then you move on next to Paradise Garage. I must have been like about 19 years old. I was working in the clothing store in Times Square when Times Square was Times Square. And that was an experience for me in Times Square. Cause that's where I got exposed to a lot of things. Now I'm traveling from, from Brooklyn to the train station. I'm still living with my moms. And I got me my first job. And my friend had went to the Paradise Garage. Again, David. He came back, yo, you gotta go to this place. It's a, it's, it's a little gay. You know, it's a lot of, you know, well, he didn't say gay because I didn't understand that word then. I just, a bunch of faggots is what he said was in there. He said, but there's a lot of women there. So I said, okay, um, I want to go. Remember getting off on West 4th, get to Carmine Street, make a right turn, and when you get to Varian, you make a left, and you get to King Street, you make a right. He said, but don't go to the door because they'll, they'll know that you came and if you, someone tries to get you in, you're not going to get in. That was the rule he explained to me in order to get into this place. Now, I've never been to Studio 54, Palladium, I didn't know anything about that stuff. I got over there and I got to the corner. He said, get someone to get you inside. I said, okay. I've seen, I guess, uh, a gay man before, and but this one was a queen. I said, excuse me, can you get me inside, please? He said, sure, darling, come with me. So I said, oh, well, okay, and I got luck. We get to the door, he said, he's with me, and I got inside. And of course, I turned the corner, the ramp, 
leading up to the garage with the lights. And uh, I got into the club. And once I got inside, it was crowded. I said, thank you very much. Oh, now you're leaving me. But I just sung him away, and I just, the music, it was the sound system that caught me. I remember turning that corner, and all I saw was thousands of people inside dancing, having a great time. There was a guy named um, Kumali with about six women dressed as squads, Indians. This is the 70s, you know, it, it was it was, it was happening. I was like, whoa! I must have stood there like about an hour when I realized that now this is really gay. And um, I felt uncomfortable, but the music was good. The music was good. I think what, what made me go back was turning that corner and watching this guy with the girls. I was interested in the girls. I think I waited about a couple of weeks. I said, Dave, let's go back. It was taking me out of Bedford Stuyvesant because then I was involved in gangs, fighting for the neighborhood, for the block. Now I wanted to dance, you know, I wanted to dance. It's like when you were searching for something but don't know what you were searching for, I found it at the Paradise Garage. And it actually made all of us closer. When we all found ourselves in the same place, we got closer, we got tighter, if that was possible. But, and we just, we rode the ride for as long as we could ride it. Did you go to the garage? Yeah. When did you start? Uh, I started going to the garage in 1983. Rican was going before me. And, um, we used to work during the week, and on the weekends it was party. Buy some clothing to wear to look good. And we always had our dancing pants, so we had our shirts and our baggy pants. And when we got inside after we paid, we start changing into our overalls, our dancing equipment. We danced. We used to dance from... As a matter of fact, we didn't dance, actually. What we did, we came on King Street in the garage. We got there at about 10 o'clock at night, and we stood out there hanging out till about 2, till about two in the morning, and then we decided to go inside because everybody used to hang out on the strip. Everybody. We used to hang out right here, Jim, and practice our moves before we went to the G, right here. We put a radio here. How old? Um, 18, 19. So what year would that be? I do the math. I'm, I'm the bad with math, but I can fight. No. Um, 78, 79. Yeah. Yeah, right around there. Right around there, right around there. We used to, no, we, yeah, and then we, it was going into the 80s now. We done had a little time now under the belt. Yeah. You know, now we, we, I was the only one with the membership, so mm. everybody was calling me. You going to the garage? It was, still, it was still kept underground. Most of the guys in the neighborhood that would go wouldn't tell, wouldn't tell the other guys where they were going. Back in those days, uh, we were just dancing and doing other things, so. We may have crossed each other on the floor, but I didn't I didn't know him personally. Tell me a little bit about your experience with Paradise Garage. Oh, Paradise Garage. Um, I was a member from 1984 till its closing 1987. And um, it was my entire inspiration. Larry Levan, uh, David DePino, Joey Llanos, that whole scene uh, from 1984 to 1987 just, um, it just basically just drew me in and I just, I just said, this is what I want to do. I want to be a promoter or a DJ. I've never been in here before, you know. Uh, unbelievable. What about you Yo, grab two cases this door in the back of the truck. <laughs> This is, this is the first logo we stole. This is what? We took this logo when we first started out. Oh, really? The dude showed up in Fort Greene. Yo, um, big tall punk ass name from San Francisco. Yo, um, I just want to let you, that's my logo. Hey, don't worry about it, bro. I'll put a beer and an afro on him, and we'll, we'll change the logo next week. Well, that's why you changed I was, I was like this. I didn't want to stop the flow. Then we're going, let me get the next slide. Yeah, I'll talk to you in a minute. Hold on, bro. <laughs> hey, I got you. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Is there anything left of us? I don't know. Yo, me and Cena were cracking up. We saw you yesterday. We were cracking up. You had two phones in your ears. Yes. <laughs> I, I hate a parade. She did a parade yesterday right out here. We didn't need no permit. Let's finish up the boardwalk and we'll make another trip back. We still here? Did you got the keys? Did you think you'd be here after November 1st? Where's November 1st? Last year. Sandy? Yeah. The minute I jumped off that truck and landed in that sand, no, actually the first thing I said was, oh shit, I'm out of business. 
and it took me six months because I didn't work. I came to volunteer. I got my rent was behind six months. I caught up. Might be a little late this month, but what was uh, the last six months getting ready for this like? <sighs> Don't want to go through that again, man. I couldn't do it again. If you are still in Zone A and can find a way to leave, leave immediately. Conditions are deteriorating very rapidly, and the window for you getting out safely is closing. As the winds start building this afternoon, it gets more and more dangerous to go outside. And so you're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. You should have left, but it's also too, getting to be too late to leave. Sure, I know it all. I know all about Coney Island hurricanes. So I had my high boots and I had sandbagged my home and my business and I was totally prepared like a know-it-all for a two-foot flood, except we didn't get a two-foot flood. We got the mother of all floods. I remember watching online as the water hit the top of the Luna Park signs and then the video cut out. I remember that very clearly. And I remember thinking that I might not have a job in the morning. When the water initially breached in the building, which we expected to happen, we expected one, maybe two feet. When the water just kept coming and coming and coming, um, and it became really apparent that this was turning into truly a disaster. And then watching the events unfold from the second story window of the museum, I had a bird's eye view of Grimaldi's, which made for an incredible visual because the water came up to two feet below the Grimaldi's Brooklyn Bridge sign. Uh, so the bridge was actually over water. Visually, that was spectacular with white caps down surf. The reality was that there was that, that dual concept going on, which was like, oh my God, this is so cool. And, Oh my God, are we going to be rowboat rescues? Like, uh, what if this keeps coming? Um, but it stopped, um, and then it receded. And then seeing the level of devastation here in the amusement zone first, because this is where I came out to, like stepping out of this door to a, a sea of dead goldfish that all surrounded our, our theater door here. Um, or finding a giant live shrimp on the corner of surf just flopping around uh, really brought it home as to where this water came from. It came from everywhere. The very first person I saw when I came out this door was Nate Bliss. And Nate Bliss was right there, just like, came to check. I knew you were in the building. And the last message I saw on Facebook was, see you on the other side. You all right? <laughs> it was October 30th, and we were all sort of walking around with in a, in a bit of a daze, um, realizing how impactful the storm had really been down here. And we were all walking around and, uh, and get, gathering a sense of how enormous the challenge ahead was going to be. Um, and then there were a few people who I think just for lack of knowing what else to do, just started grabbing brooms and dra grabbing shovels and trying to help. And Rican was one of the first people I saw out there trying to help. And. Uh, in the days that followed, as uh, we all got more organized, Rikin and others never went away. They worked every day, and uh, we, we found each other gasoline, we found each other uh, shovels and brooms, and we started cleaning up. Uh, Rikin was out here already cleaning up and talking about bringing a, a massive amount of volunteers over the weekend, and I said, wow, that's great, that's great, that's great, wonderful. And he. He really put it together and got guys out here, and I was impressed. I was like, wow, that's a lot of people to volunteer. I mean, they had the boardwalk cleaned in a couple of weekends. You, you, there was a ton of people out here. And he was responsible for a good portion of that cleanup. And, uh, and, and actually, he said, do you, do you want some of the volunteers to help you clean up the park? I said, no, 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 the boardwalk, get the boardwalk done, because you know, there was feet of sand in, in the park, and the fire trucks were buried in, in two feet of sand. And we couldn't even open the gates because the boardwalk sand had piled up against our gates. So I said to him, if you can get the gates clear, we can at least open them and get rid of the sand that's in the park. When I see back to the first days 
of after Sandy. Now I realize how we were not aware of what actually happened. Uh, I say this because we were trying to take care of many little things when we have a tremendous damage. So I realized that we it took a while for us to understand the, the dimensions of, of the damage. Talking about our friend Rican, uh, I got the opportunity to know another aspect of his personality that I didn't know before. I saw him in action that I never seen before. So I, I will, I can say that uh, after Sandy and after watching him getting involved so deeply with the, what was, we were, everybody was working to bring Coney Island back to a nice place, a nice and clean place. Uh, I, he gained my respect after that, and I, and I realized that it was a great opportunity for him that. that not only to, to gain some people respect, but to demonstrate to all the stakeholders in Coney Island that he is not here just to do something that he likes, but that he cares about Coney Island. Well, I own two stores in Coney Island. My store on the boardwalk was fine, miraculously. My other store in the Stillwell Avenue subway station was completely destroyed. Um, my store on the boardwalk was fine, but we lost electricity for a month. So when we were trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do? We don't have electricity. We want to be open. Guess who strolls up with this gigantic generator, like a generator that could, you know, run like amusement park rides. And he just lent it to us to use. So we were able to open our shop after Sandy. It was absolutely Regan who was the one who right away was in action and absolutely had people's best interests in mind about doing something. So he wasn't held back by red tape or waiting for permission, he got in and helped the people right away and it was with his enthusiasm and into action right away that we were able to work with him to make the magic happen that the Coney cleanup ended up representing. I want these. Where's the other XLRs, baby? Time. 735. 735. Late. I gotta be there by 8 o'clock. The music, because I know you're on the parade, it's low. Boom. Okay. Fuck it, I can't fucking pinky in the brains. Are we still here? And we are dedicated to bringing back the people's playground and the Coney Island community back from that devastation of Hurricane Sandy. So any donations that you can make is certainly appreciated. I go into the ocean over here once a year. And that's New Year's Day, and I've been doing that for 13, 14 years. This year, I just stayed in. I, and, then I, and then I thought about the irony of being in there to wash away the flood and going, well, that's just ridiculous, because I'm kind of mad at you, Ocean, right now. You're going to mess with me. But the Ocean and I have made our mess. think about it that was so soon after the storm um, and already that you know this this happened within days of the storm people saying of course we're gonna rebuild of course Coney Island will be back um, and I was one of the people saying that and I think 75% believing it just knowing all the work that needed to be done but by January 1st um, you know people were still very much out of house and home a lot of the businesses would remain closed for months after that but we had thousands of people on the beach 
on January 1st, being crazy as they always are, jumping in the water. I think the plunge was a good first step. It was nice to get something off the ground, something positive. And the fact that we didn't have to wait for the opening of the, of the boardwalk and of, of the amusements until Palm Sunday, we were able to get something under our belts within a couple of months of the destruction was, was a good thing. It, it, it was a good morale booster and changer for people that were still down in the dumps. This year, you know, I think just like after New Orleans was flooded, it was important for New Orleans to do Mardi Gras, just to assert that it was still New Orleans. Um, right after the flood, um, you know, when the damage was still obvious, when spirits were still down, I think it was a way of showing support and love for Coney Island. Uh, that so many people turned out and uh, just, you know, people care about this place. It is a important place. It is New York City culture. I'm over here, Rican. I'm on. I set up the boardwalk. I just left there. I got my speech. These cocksuckers. Oh, we're going to set up in front of MCU Park. This is not in front of MCU Park. That's all about a fucking parking lot. I'm over. I'm by the parking lot right now. You know, hey, see. Alex, this is the hotel. He wants me to he charge me electricity. Come on. Take everything out. I'll walk all right over there. But he don't know who he's talking to. That's what it is. He think I'm some fucking, he thinks I'm some Puerto Rican from the neighborhood that wear the hat back where he's gonna find out. He can talk to his boss about that shit. I don't pay nobody. I'm so sorry. You know how I get. Mm -hmm. All right, no hard feelings. All right, now you know how I am. Let's just get this thing out of here. I'm gonna go get the generator. <clears throat> um, um, over here, Papa. We keep an eye on it. That's right here. You're gonna have a, a speaker there, a speaker there, a speaker there, and one all the way down there. Tony Allen Dancers. Speaking. Well, you better be over there at um, Surf Avenue and 10th Street. Somebody will pick you up at 9 on the dock. If you're not there, don't bother coming. I'll tell you straight up, because there's a mermaid parade out here, and we have zero tolerance today. Be there at 9 o'clock, okay? Rican's the guy that uh, the misdemeanor criminals, instead of sentenced to Jill gets sentenced to Rican, the cool hand Luke problem. And they help him sweep up. Yeah, we all thought that was a good thing, but after Sandy, we needed Rican and his volunteers and his cool hand Luke petty criminals. Like I said, it's from nine to five. It's cold, man. It's cold today. One hour lunch break. Here we go. My name is Keith Suba. I'm the founder of the Suba Foundation in Coney Island. I'm a part of the Coney Island Dancers. I support Rican, what he does with the Cool Hand Luke program. He started it from nothing, you know, as, as an ideal. He got involved with the district attorney's office and they started sending individuals here to the boardwalk. They started cleaning up, doing the miscellaneous cleanup. And from time to time, I come out and I mentor the young men that are in his group. My name is Christopher Borelli. I'm from Coney Island, born and raised, 2930 West 30th Street. Uh, and why are you here? I'm here because I ain't paid a fine. What was the fine for? $500. For? For um, um, petty larceny. Okay. And, uh, you know what I mean? I'm learning from my mistakes. I ain't coming back here no more. Because he makes us work hard, you know what I mean? They don't just take people for no reason, you know what I mean? He make them come here, work. They don't want to ever come back. Plain and simple. And have them give you a wheelbarrow. And they'll tell Brian, tell Brian to give you a wheelbarrow. So like this. You're new here, so they'll, they'll hook you right up, right? Go, You're going to hang out with me today. Get your hands out your pockets. You got me nervous, man. You been to jail, nigga? Huh? Huh? You been to jail? You high? Listen. 
All right, I'm gonna do it right now. I'm setting you up right now. I get the generator over there. We're getting a table. We're gonna have two mics and one corner. That's great. Right? You got it. Staff. Staff. Yeah, I'm gonna put it on right now. Fuck Jim Mick. Well, not, not Jim I'm sorry. Fuck Dick Ziggy. I'm talking about after the parade. I got it right now, horse face. Now that's the mayor. That's my man. Two and two. Hey, handsome, hot shot. Two shots. Oh, yeah, man. Taking Rican's voluntary uh, participation in the cleanup uh, right after the storm. Also, the work he's done over the past few years with uh, the DA's office, with the um, what he calls the Cool Hand Loop program, uh, which is uh, oversight for uh, some community service folks from the DA's office. Um, it became clear that that Reekin had a passion not just for uh, turntables and heavy bass, but also for. Uh, reinvestment in, in his community and a real knack for keeping people organized. Um, so it was a few weeks after the storm and I sat down with Rican and, and I said, would you like to apply yourself to creating a new company? Well, I mean, he succeeded in that he, he actually pulled it off, you know, like we got the contract. Um, and, you know, somehow he has gotten people like myself included, to do the things that he is unable to do. You know, like writing grants and uh, taking care of payroll and, you know, so he does, he does plenty of organizational stuff though. He, he has stepped up in a big way. He has uh, several employees, he has uh, nice trim uniforms, um, and it's a, it's a project that, you know, will, will grow or not, depending on Regan's own um, investment back into that business. But I think where he, he still has a lot of work to go is dealing with people. You know, he's so accustomed to this, this street mentality and like uh, yeah. cutting someone before Mommy. they cut him. Mommy. He gave me opportunity and I, like I said, he's learned a lot about the way city government works and, and how private business works. and. He's, uh, he's doing a great job, man, no complaints. He's out here every weekend, every day, and he's cleaning with his crew, and he's cracking his whip, and he doesn't let anybody uh, slack off. The latest news and gossip is that the break will begin at 1 p.m. That gossip is true. The parade begins at 1 p.m. sharp. Welcome to the 2013 31st Annual Mermaid Parade. Too much fun going on. So I went to Albany to go 
the track trailer school. It was a four month course, and I met Crystal. And that's where Rican and Selena came. And then you moved back here what year? Three, somewhere around there. And okay, so you weren't there that long? No, no, because I bet Selena was born, and then we came back, we moved to New York for a little while, then we went back up to Albany, and then Rican was born, and I couldn't take it up there. You know, I was suffering from anxiety and all that. And when, okay, so what were you doing for work from 80 to 99? I tell you, I have to kill you. I was a criminal. Okay. There it is. Criminal. I just didn't get caught. So I'm not proud of those things. You know, I'm not proud of that, you know. I mean, I'm joking around, I was a criminal, retired, told the judge, took my peanut and all that. I ain't proud of none of that dumb shit. That's why my investment is my son. You know, there's little money that was put away for him. And I wish I could take care of the other ones, but my ex-wife, she does well. She's a state trooper. And Your ex wife's a state trooper. Don't tell her you know me if she pulls you over. She'll empty out the clip on you. Where is she? Please, no autographs, darling. Have you seen her? You're on the boardwalk. You're yeah, on the boardwalk now, but I'm looking for my float. I'm looking for my float. Where is it? I don't know. That's not that looking. I'm out of doing storage, hooking it all up, making it pretty. So I'm going back to see David and them. Where are you going? I'm following you. Well, let's go, girl. All right, my friend, Rich. God bless you. She has a thing. If I had some, I'd I'd love to have my own pram like that. How's the what? Still won't give you no pussy. I'm in the doghouse. <laughs> you asked, there it is. <laughs> How did you meet her? Huh? Who's I ran into him on the dance floor and he was he had this pink hat on and I think he had overalls and he was being very flamboyant and animated and um, I thought he was gay and he was like ooh you're cute you know who are you here with or something like that and just you know came up and was dancing with me and and being silly and so whatever, we were having fun. When I was whole hopping and um What does that mean? Oh, I was looking for pussy nigga. <laughs> I was going for club to club with my man Ivan. And I'm gonna tell you exactly how I met C. I was wearing these pink overalls and this pink hat. No, it wasn't a pink hat, it was a loud silver Michael Jackson hat running around through the club. I was flipping all over the club. I, that was dancing. That was like five years ago. I was still I was six years ago. I was still dancing. That's exactly. I fell in love with Cena right there. I went in this club and she was standing there, propped up like a mannequin. And of course, I had to check the rear end. You know what I'm saying? I look. I say, hey, listen, um, who be here? She's down here with someone. I, say, I said, who? yeah, I'm. I'm kind of on the prowl for that guy over there. This guy that I'd been crushing on for months and getting nowhere with. Um, and he was like, who? Let me get him for you. And he makes a beeline in the direction of this guy I'd indicated. And so I went the other way <laughs> and avoided him for the rest of the night. That was the first run in. We ran into each other one more time. I didn't see her for about a month and a half. I went to this, I got to this club one day on 14th Street in Manhattan, and there she was. She ran up on my like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, whoa. So um, I asked her to come to have breakfast with me, and that's how I met her. And I don't know how the hell we've been together this long. It's not easy living with me.
200 and so on. I don't expect you guys to be me, but that's why I keep telling you, you cannot kiki with them, you cannot ask them for a cigarette, they're not your fucking friends, you know what I'm saying, these are young kids coming here, you guys might not be doing it, why I'm, why, the reason why I have, I have my reason why I'm doing it, alright, it keeps me from going nuts, and I just want to give back a little bit, and, and, and all that bullshit that comes with that, okay, there are a bunch of young kids, believe me, a lot of these young kids don't know what it is, what to go is, what to go upstate, and go and, and, and go up top and go into the monkey house. I mean, it's really rough up there. You know, these are young kids that probably have no daddies like me and that type of shit. You know what I'm saying? And, and you don't know. So you can't save all of them. Right. But I've had a few in the last two and a half years I've been doing this thing. Yo, Rick, I'm doing this. I'm going to school. Right? And that's cool. That's a nice. You know, that's a nice ending for them. You know. So that's what that's what I'm trying to tell you about community service. Don't fuck with. Don't fuck with them. Fuck you say with this shovel, motherfucker. You fucking around with me. That was about a year ago when I first started this shit. And this motherfucker was raised up. And I said, nigga, I'll crack your wheel right now. You know what I'm saying? But that's just, I don't, I don't, I'm don't. i not here for you guys to fight. I'm just telling you, you don't know what's coming. Right. Yeah. You know? Well, what y'all got to do, y'all? Come on, man. Y'all niggas are street, nigga. Y'all. Yeah, he said that twice. And another thing, if somebody's giving you trouble, don't come whispering to a bitch after it's over. <laughs> Bring that motherfucker to me or to Rika and get ready. Yo, this nigga don't want to work. <laughs> and we'd be like, oh, really? Get a shovel and come up under this boardwalk and shovel until you dig another tunnel into another state, bitch. <laughs> Very that excuse my French on camera, but yeah. Because <laughs> we, need, we need the ones, the troublemakers with us, because you can handle them. And keep the ones that's doing what you say with you in the street, because we don't want y'all getting into no conversation right. that's not what in we're the street. Right. That's right. We're going to be up at 4 in the morning. We gotta do this fucking show here. And it's just music and hey, welcome to Coney Island, that type of shit. You can make it, come on down, play Rocky song. Vanessa! Oh shit. Yeah, Nessa's ass over here! Nessa! You can play Rocky song. You can play Rocky song. I need to watch you at all times. Please play that. We're gonna have to play, but that's for the race, the people that are running. I have four of these pop ups, man. Superstorm Sandy took him away. And by the way, horse face, I'm not intimidating, okay? I am not intimidating. And the good thing, there's two good things about me. I own equipment, and I'm not a DJ. DJs are prima donna, tired ass queens. Oh, my makeup's not all right. Oh, my pants is too tight. But these are good. Do not stop for coffee, all right? Viagra, whatever it is you... Listen, dude. Yo, listen. When You you know what? If they shut these streets down, I'm going to kick your ass in that fucking ass.
Yes, I was tired, but I had a bunch of, you know, I, it, there was something that we, that I normally can, I can do, it's just that the community service was involved, there's no leaders where I'm at, man. you know what I'm saying, you know, I, it has to run this way, and I haven't found the right guy, I think Rome, the female with the, with the dreadlocks, she's embarrassing all the men in my company, okay? I tell her this, this, and this, how I want to run, and she does it the way I, I, I don't know what it is. it is. She wants to prove herself. Me and him, see, but he's crazy, though. I'm like, ooh, I don't know if i ever be able to work here. Look at me now. You never know till you, I guess, try or ask, huh? Have you ever met anyone like him? Hell no. And I don't think I'll ever meet anyone like him. What was your initial impression? I hope you don't kill me. <laughs> he got a little temper, dude. But that's just how he is. You have to know him to know, like, that's just reeking, you know what I mean? That's just reeking. Everybody's not gonna be sweet and calm, and he just gonna give it to you real. I respect him for that, though. He just, no edges, you know what I mean? He's straight roll. I know he is a kid, but I think he's totally gay. <laughs> I guess I get it from my grandfather. Not that he was gay, but I get my, you know, loud, they don't give up F attitude and who cares who's looking. Not everybody has that. It's too much for me a lot of the time. I don't, I don't like to see him queening around. It's, it's very unattractive to me to see my man doing that. I really, I'm not sure why he does it. Not everybody that grew up where you grew up would do this. No, hell to the no. But I'll tell you one thing, um, wow, I go in, I work so many gay clubs. Not really a whole lot of them. I went to the garage, I lived in that place. I was dancing there. Growing up in, you know, in the club scene with the gay community, it was, you know, it has its, it has its, its downfalls, but it was more of a fun, I mean, I, there was red, man, I, could, I can't even count them. You know, how many incidents, you know, unless <sighs> my man left me, you know, something like that. I said, damn, we can go here. The gay guy will bring all his sisters with him, and, and then, all, you know, they're, they're, you know, these wicked girls, and here we were, waiting in the cut, like vultures. Oh, no, 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 you ain't seen nothing, honey. No, I don't want to speak no more. <laughs> oh, shit. Ah. Oh, uh -huh. shit. Oh, uh -huh. Now you know. Oh, no. Why does it do this? Ooh, remind me of something. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. girl. Oh, oh, my God. Look at this. All right. I want to make a public announcement straight up. I am straight. There you have it.
Ever like in your when you were a little kid, say I'm gonna get myself plastered, my picture plastered all over. No, it. no, hell no. But I always wanted to be an action figure, like a GI Joe. I didn't mind that. And, you know, who knows? I might come up with some Commander in Chief dolls. <laughs> I'll buy one. You buy one. <laughs> Bobbleheads. Yeah, bobbleheads. Just now, I don't like those. I want a real one <laughs> with the kung fu grip. I think Greekin should probably be the poster child for insecure people that want to do self-promotion with that van. Everybody who's suffering out there with some sort of insecurity, just go buy a vehicle, put your picture all over it, drive around town, and make yourself a celebrity. Uh, he is a legend in his own mind, and that's where you've got to start, is being a legend in your own mind before anybody else will think you're a legend. Now, my greeting to Rican is this. <laughs> I saw this van, the Coney Island Dancers logo on it, and there's picture of him in his cat in his captain's suit. I'm like, what the is that Reekin? The van is as important to Reekin as the white commander's outfit. Even more so, because he's not dressed uh, in his whites every day. Sometimes in, he's in his uh, leather vest. Um, sometimes even more incognito, but every day, constantly in the amusement park. Me, I live uh, off of Mermaid Avenue. I see the van there. If you're at Home Depot, you'll see the van there. That van is everywhere in the neighborhood, and it's his business card. It is his calling card. It is his billboard. It is his identity. It's, you know, he talks about his other main influence, aside from me being Liberace and you know, I think he should go full out and uh, customize the van with two candelabras and light candles and drive up and down the street. generator up on the boardwalk and um, I was told you know you gotta have a permit for that it's not safe so one day I'm standing there when we came I said how are we gonna get this why we can't run on top of the board I said oh shit under the boardwalk so we crawled in through that side of the fence one day we didn't have access to here and um, we were doing it for a while that way until the Community service kicked in, the Coney Corps program kicked in, and um, we have access to keep the buckets and stuff in. It made it easier for me. We don't have to climb over the fence anymore. They know we're down here, and this is part of um, doing events for the community. And it's easier this way. Ready, Jeter? Right here, your horse face. <laughs> I got a paycheck. We's balling on a Sunday. <laughs> Gentlemen, good morning. How are you? God bless you guys. Playing with yourself? Now, I've been doing events here for about six years, and there's rules for my events. Last time, they gave out 17 summonses, and we're not going to have any of that stuff here. There's no drinking alcohol here, no marijuana here, and that's the way it is. Those are the rules here. Okay? So we're here to have fun. This is the children's playground, and this is the way I'm running it. You don't like it, get out. Those are the rules. You ready? Okay, respect, and then we'll have some free fun. Take it away.
think it's a responsibility of anyone who comes to the beach, uh, whether they're an individual patron or they're organizing an event, especially if they're organizing an event, to realize that they're on shared public space. I think Regan takes that challenge to heart. Regan changed the focus of even his Coney Island dancers and made it this sort of beacon of alcohol, drug-free, fun party. Uh, much more family friendly, much more, hey, you don't have to be high to have fun. And I think that was the first thing that attracted me to him, was when he made that switch over, he was like, you know, this, this, uh, all right, this is a guy I want to pay attention to because I completely respect that. And, you know, he's finding a way to really reach out to the community in a different way. He respects what's going on in Coney Island. He respects the fact that uh, we're, we're a family destination and we want, we want to provide good family entertainment. And uh, drug-free and alcohol-free zones is, is important to us here. Very important. But I know now that coming into the Mermaid Parade, it is that serious. Playtime's over. Um, like I said, I'm going to have the plank. You will walk the fucking plank and get out of my fucking face, and we're going to get this thing done. We're going to have fun doing it, and I don't want no, um, no waves. I'm not going to allow nobody to make any waves, you know, and we're going to have fun doing this. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. This one's a big one. This is the big year, man. You know what happened here. But I think it's a. You know what else, too, Jim? I haven't stopped since last year. We went right through the winter in Coney Island, man. I never, I never did anything like this in my life. I couldn't believe it. when I realized it. Now I'm like, damn, man. Shit. We haven't stopped since last year, man. I'm looking forward to October 31st. Have a nice season goodbye. I hope we don't get another. I don't know. I don't want we don't want no more Sandys, man. Cause there's another Sandy here. Then. I'm not coming out here to volunteer. Shit. It's just too much, man. It took its toll on me, man. It was very stressful. And, I mean, so everybody got affected out here. Being in the dark, affecting everybody's family. People got replaced. It's crazy. <laughs> No more, no more. Least favorite thing about Regan? He doesn't know when to stop. His vulgarity. <laughs> it's kind of like, I don't know, it's one of those things like, you know, I, I love it sometimes and it's funny and it's appropriate and then there's other times that it's inappropriate and it's very immature, but it's him. It's his mouth. It, it can be reckless. If you know him, it can be reckless. I'm trying to hone him off of that, but. He's a work in progress still. When he makes stupid mistakes and shoots himself in the foot. The rage. The ugly monster that he has been trying to gain control of. I would give him a dose of patience. Favorite thing about Rika? <laughs> I mean, as crazy as it is, his vulgarity. I mean, I always feel like I'm never as bad when I'm around him because he's always he always takes the cake. He's always like the, the the most intense. Once he starts something he will finish it. He doesn't start anything and let it go. He tries to see it through to the end. The energy level that he doesn't give up, that he keeps coming back. It's his tenderness. He has a really gentle, loving, affectionate side. There's no one else like Regan. And not because there's be like too many Regans in the world.
The Coney Island dancers. Thank you. We are the, we're bigger than the Beatles. So follow the real heavy hitters right here. Pick up a summer schedule. Get the schedules out, please. Excuse me. Hello. <laughs>